we know there is not matter. It also turns out there isn't space or time either. This was Einstein's realization with the special theory of relativity, which he realized the speed of light is absolute, the same for all observers, whatever their speed, which was a complete weird thing at the time. You know, if you're traveling down the road in a car at 40 miles an hour and somebody passes you at 60 miles an hour, they go past you 20 miles an hour faster, right? If light goes past you, light travels 186,000 miles an hour, you don't subtract the 40. It goes to 186 miles a second, it's much faster than that. You don't subtract the 40. Even if you're traveling at nine-tenths the speed of light, it still goes past you at the speed of light, not one-tenth. All observers measure the speed of light to be the same. The revolutionary thing that came out of that was that space and time are not constant but vary with the speed of the observer. Space and time are not fixed. So, you know, if a stationary observer observes a ray of light going by and it goes 186,000 miles in one second, somebody moving at 87% the speed of light, that's just the way the mathematics work out, would see half that amount of distance and half that amount of time. But the speed would still be the same. 93,000 miles in half a second is 186,000 miles a second. Someone moving at 99.5% the speed of light sees a tenth of that. 18,000 miles in a tenth of a second. Still the same speed. And what Einstein realized was there was something called the space-time continuum out of which space and time both appear. The space-time continuum, he make it, it's not like space, it's not like time, it's not a mixture of the two, it's something we don't know. It's like Kant described, it's the noumenon. We can never actually know it. What we know is the space and time it gives rise to. But it never gives rise to the same amounts of space and time. Different observers see different amounts of space and time. So space and time vary. What he showed was there's something in space-time called the interval, which is like the equivalent of distance or seconds, the interval is actually the subtraction of the square of space and time. It's actually the square root of that. And that turns out to always be constant. So in space-time, there is a constant. The distance in space-time never changes, although what we experience as space and time changes. So this led to some more weird things about light. What happens if you actually do travel at 100% the speed of light? If you look at the way things are going, you're right. Light experiences itself traveling no distance in no time. From light's point of view, light does not exist in space and time. As Fred was saying at the opening, the birth and death of a photon are the same moment. Light doesn't experience itself traveling through space and time. There is no non-locality for light. It is one phenomena in one moment. This is light's point of view. So the reason for this is that the, the space-time interval in the space-time continuum for light is always zero. Always zero. So from light's point of view, no space, no time, no mass. Light does not exist in the world of space, time, and matter. So what do we make of this thing called the constant speed? I put speed in quotes deliberately. What we observe as speed, I don't think is speed at all. When I observe a light beam traveling from you know, the back of the room to my eye, in space, time, the beginning and end of that light beam are the same. Space-time is bent so that they are the same. In my frame of reference, I stretch out that zero interval <laughs> into space and time. And I always stretch out 186,000 miles of space for every second of time. And if I'm moving very fast, I stretch out that much. Moving slower that much. Really slow, I stretch out that much. So I don't think C is a speed at all. It's the constant ratio of manifestation of space and time. 
for every 186,000 miles of space that appears, one second of time appears. <laughs> and again, Kant was onto this 200 years ago. He said, space and time are the framework within which the mind is constrained to construct its experience of reality. He didn't see that space and time were part of the external world. They're part of the mind. And it was 100 years later that Einstein came along and showed that he was true. And I think if we ever give a name to this revolution in consciousness, just as we talk about the revolution in the view of the Earth as the Copernican revolution, because Copernican started it, I think this revolution in consciousness we should really call the Kantian revolution. And it's only 200 years. The Copernican revolution took 150 years. We're only 200 years into this revolution, and it's much, much more fundamental. So space and time don't exist. Matter doesn't exist. Energy, we often think, is fundamental. We all talk about energy as in the universe is energy. Turns out, it isn't. <laughs> and this comes to the other great breakthrough of the 20th century, same year as Einstein's theory of relativity, and Einstein was involved in this, quantum theory, and again to do with light. Fascinating enough, it's problems with light that started off quantum theory. And what Max Planck showed was that light comes in discrete packets of energy. These are called photons. Before that, it was thought that light was smooth, <coughs> continuous, and he showed it comes in packets, amounts. The word quanta actually means amount. And it's actually a quantum, not of energy, it's actually a quantum of action, which is often missed. Planck's constant is called the quantum of action. Now, what is action? Action's a word which... We don't meet in school, but we should do. We come across things like mass, distance, time. Velocity is mass time, you know, length divided by time. Underneath are just the units. This, this is how mathematicians look at it. So velocity is length divided by time. Momentum is mass times velocity. So you get it's mass times length over time. And those of you who did a little bit of maths or mechanics at school will remember that all this stuff. Action is just another one of these qualities. It's actually mass times length squared over time, which you can get it two ways. It's either, if you look at it, it's momentum times distance traveled, or it's energy times the time the energy is operating. That's action. But we don't normally meet it at school, except in some very fundamental principles. You've probably heard the principle of least action. It's actually a very important principle. It says, in any... In any process, nature always does it in a way that the amount of action used is a minimum. The golden principle in physics. Everything goes by this principle of how do you keep action to an absolute minimum. <laughs> so action turns out to be more fundamental. And Planck's constant, the quantum of action, it's called Planck's constant, and here it is. For those of you who love zeros, <laughs> very, very small, but it's not energy. Energy is erg. This is erg seconds. It's not actually energy. So every single photon of light is an identical unit of action. So whatever the underlying field is, the unified field, the field of consciousness, whatever it is, it seems the, very, the first manifestation is actually action. So manifestation is action, is activity, which then begins to appear as mass and energy related again by, we talk about the speed of light, E equals mc squared, and we think, what is the speed of light doing relating energy and mass? If you take C to be the ratio of, trans uh, ratio of manifestation of space and time, then it makes much more sense that energy and mass are related by the ratio of manifestation of space and time. So, we're nearly there. By the way, there's another connection here between light and consciousness. Light has no space, doesn't know time, doesn't know mass. Consciousness isn't in the material world. It doesn't, it isn't something with mass. More matter appears in the mind. But also, if you look at the mystical experience, the experience of pure consciousness, when all those forms in the mind that stir the mind up. The Yoga Sutras, the first line of the Yoga Sutras, say yoga 
that mystical state is the stilling of mind stuff, the stilling of all that whirling of chitta, of all those forms. When that stills down, you arrive at a state of consciousness in which time drops out. It is boundless. There's no sense of spatial boundaries. There's no matter. So pure consciousness that the mystics experience is just like light. So where we seem to be going with this, the normal view of what happens with light is something like that. A photon goes from the point of emission to the point of absorption. From light's point of view, space and time are so warped that the point of emission, the point of absorption are coincident. And the photon is an exchange of action between two points. It's an interaction between two points which are, from its point of view, coincidence. There isn't a transmission across space and time. Space and time collapse. There is the exchange of an action. From light's point of view, from our point of view, it's different. From our point of view, it seems to cross space and time. And so we say, well, if light got from here to there, how did it get there? It must have traveled somehow. Did it travel as a wave or did it travel as a particle? And sometimes we look at it, it travels as a wave. Sometimes we look at it, it travels as a particle. That's because we have stretched out the zero interval into space and time and then try to answer the question from that frame of reference. <laughs> If you look at it from light's frame of reference, and I think the only real way to look at light is from light's own point of view, (laughs) not from our material point of view, it doesn't need to be a wave or a particle because it doesn't go anywhere. 